In the New Testament, there are many stories and examples of people being saved. And that, uh, that passage that Brother Jackson just read for us is, is again, one of, one of many we find. The stories about people being saved have been recorded for us not only to, to learn, but also for us to, to follow and make application from. Well, how do I know this? I know this because this is what uh, the New Testament specifically says. Consider Paul's words found here in 1 Timothy 1. Verses 15 and 16. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering, and then notice what he says here, for a pattern to them what should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So Paul here in his own words talks about the mercy that he received from Jesus Christ. You know, him being saved. And he's telling us that how he was converted, that is an example or that's a, that's a pattern for us to follow. If we too are going to believe in Jesus Christ to life everlasting. And so the stories in the Bible about lost people being saved, they are meant to be followed. They are patterns for us to repeat. Uh, there's, there, you know, the Christians in ancient times weren't saved one way, and we today are saved a different way. You know, people who are saved today are saved the exact same way as those first Christians we read about in the pages of the New Testament. And so this morning, my uh, main focus is going to be on Paul's conversion and the purpose of baptism. And I will also quickly mention other important aspects <coughs> of conversion. So if you have your Bible, I encourage you to open it with me to Acts chapter 22. The book of Acts chapter 22, that's where uh, we will start reading this uh, this morning. And we're going to focus, uh, start here focusing on Paul's conversion and the importance of baptism. The Bible teaches baptism is necessary to be saved. Now, just a moment ago, I, I read how Paul is an example or a pattern for us to follow if we too want to have salvation, if we want everlasting life. And so I'd like us to read two parallel passages this morning about his conversion. Uh, and again, the first one will be in Acts chapter 22, the book of Acts 22. Now, before I, I, I read this uh, with you, um, and I think many of you know this, but in case there's someone who, who does not, uh, there are many people in the world who do not believe baptism plays any role in salvation. It has nothing to do uh, with salvation. And I would encourage you that if you have doubts or if you have questions about the purpose of baptism, um, I'm more than willing to study with people, you know, if that's something you would want. But I encourage you, first of all, and always regarding any topic, do your own study. You know, get a concordance, uh, look up passages which contain the word baptism, and just simply read through that context in, in Scripture. You know, read you know, that paragraph or that chapter, if you're willing to read that much. And think about what the Bible itself is telling you about this, this teaching called baptism. And I'm confident that anyone who truly believes in the Bible, uh, who's receptive to what the Bible teaches, that person can see for himself or herself that baptism is necessary to be saved. I think the Bible's just crystal clear on that. Well, if the Bible is clear on this point then why is it that there are people who believe baptism plays no role in someone's salvation? Well, the simple answer is they've been taught by a denomination that it's not important. I mean, that's really the bottom line. And you could ask that question about anything. Why are there some folks today who believe that it's a good thing to pray to the Virgin Mary, even though the New Testament makes no mention of that? Well, they've been taught some kind of tradition. They've been taught some kind of belief it does not come from the word of God. And simply, the, again, that's the simple answer. Why there are people in the world who believe baptism is, is not important. Even though as we look at the, the scriptures, the scriptures plainly teach it is important. So with all that in mind, let's read from Acts 22. Acts 22, we're going to start with uh, verses 6 and following. And uh, as we read this passage, there are, there are three people uh, that we find here. 
the first is Saul, who we're more familiar with by the name of, of Paul. Right? So we read about him, Saul, a.k.a. Paul. Uh, we also read about Jesus. And then another important figure that we, we find in this passage and also another passage we'll look at is a man named Ananias. Uh, Ananias was a, a faithful disciple, and he received instructions from Jesus to, to go to Paul and speak with Paul and do several, several important things. So these are the three people we find, the three main people we find in this passage. Saul, a.k.a. Paul, Jesus, and Ananias. So Acts 22, starting with verse 6. Again, these are the words of Paul. He says, It came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh to Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. And I fell into the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise, and go into Damascus, and there shall be told thee of all the things which are appointed for thee to do. And when I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked upon him. And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now, why tarriest thou? Arise, and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And so we can see here that it was at Paul's baptism that his sins were washed away not before right at his baptism mentioned there in verse 16 and that's important to know because a lot of people will say Paul was saved on the road to Damascus when he spoke with Jesus but you've just now created a contradiction in the text because it's not until he makes it to Damascus and Ananias speaks with him and then when he's baptized, again, that's when he has his sins washed away. You can't be saved and still be guilty of sin. You still carry that guilt. And so after Paul's encounter with Jesus was over, you can notice the series of events. He was blind. According to Acts 9, verse 9, and we'll, we'll read from that passage in just a moment. Uh, he did not eat or drink for three days. And then it's only when we come to what's said in verse 16 that his sin problem is taken care of. So with all that in mind, it's when he followed the instructions that Jesus would give him. And here these instructions were delivered by Ananias, a faithful man. But again, they're ultimately coming from Christ. It's when he actually followed the instructions of the Lord, that is when he was saved. Now with all that in mind, please turn to Acts chapter 9 with me. This, uh, this account of Paul's conversion is actually recorded three separate times in the book of Acts. Again, that's, that's emphasizing how important it is for us to know this story of how he was saved. Again, he, he told us himself that uh, his conversion is a, is a pattern for us to follow if we too want to believe in Christ and have life everlasting. So here in Acts 9, this is a parallel account of what we've just read in Acts 22. And if you follow the chronology of Paul's conversion, it's only after he was baptized that things take a positive turn uh, in his life. Now, I encourage you to read all of Acts 9 in your free time. Read all the book of Acts in your free time. Um, we're going to skip verses 1 through 8. There's a, there's a reiteration there of, again, Paul's trip to Damascus and, and how Jesus appeared to him uh, on, that, on that road to Damascus. 
Um, if we start there with verse 9, Acts 9, verse 9, again, it says he was three days without sight and neither did eat nor drink. So after his encounter with Jesus, again, he's, he's stricken with blindness and he now engages in a complete fast, no food and no water for a total of, of three days. Now let's continue reading because there's some additional information here regarding Jesus and Ananias and the conversation they have. And these details are not recorded in Acts 22. So let's start with verse 10, Acts 9, verse 10. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in the vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he's a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So if we just pause there for a moment, it's, again, it's important to, to pay attention to this whole conversation. Notice at first, Ananias doesn't even want to go to Paul. He's afraid of Paul. He's heard about all the evil things, the, the wicked things Paul has done. And so we ought to know when this man goes to Paul, he's not simply doing what he wants to do. Ananias is carrying out the instructions of the Lord. And here we read about the risen Christ appearing to this man in a vision and instructing him to go to Paul and do what needs to be done. And so that's what, that's what takes place here. So picking up there with verse 17, Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales. And he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. And there's a little bit more to this story. But again, I encourage you to read the rest um, in your free time. So Ananias, who was sent by Jesus, healed Paul. Apparently he had the gift of healing. He healed Paul of his blindness. Notice this text mentions briefly he was baptized. Uh, Acts 22, which we read earlier, gives more information about baptism. But here it says he was baptized. And again, notice all the positive things that happened after he was uh, baptized. Again, mentioned there at the end of verse 18. After he was immersed, he ate some food. Breaking this uh, three-day fast he was on. Um, it says there in verses 19 and 20, he spent time with the disciples. And he preached that Christ is the Son of God. And again, these three positive things, <clears throat> him ending his fast, him fellowshipping with Christians, him preaching about Jesus, all these only happened after his baptism. Again, after his sins were washed away when he submitted to the will of Christ. And so again, we can see here there's, there's something we ought to learn from this. There's a pattern. Now, there's a, there's a lot of things besides baptism we can learn. Right? Faith is one of them. Trust in Christ is, is one of them. But apparently, uh, evidently, baptism is important. Because again, we see at that point, that's when these positive changes occur in his life. And it's at that point his sins were washed away. Uh, now the following are some verses which specifically mention the words baptism and salvation, or some equivalent of salvation. I'll, I'll point that out as, as we go on here. I just have a few um, passages to share with you regarding this. And uh, then we'll quickly move on to a few other things. Uh, we're going to start here in Mark 16, 
Uh, this is a, a context that uh, many people will refer to as the Great Commission. Right? These are Jesus' words after his death, burial, and resurrection uh, when he's giving his apostles uh, this great commission or this final charge to go share the gospel with people of, of all nations throughout all the world. So this is Mark's account, Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. He says to them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, according to verse 16, both belief and baptism are required to be saved. Again, notice that. It specifically mentions the word saved here. And again, I'm going to try to emphasize these, these verses I'm going to share with you. I'm going to try to show you verses which speak about salvation or some equivalent. So again, believe and be baptized. Why? To be saved. Again, that's what Jesus says, not what I say, not what the church of Christ says. That's what the scriptures say. Faith and submitting to baptism are not in contradiction. They are not mutually exclusive. These things go together. They, they complement uh, one another. Um, next is Acts 2.38. Again, in this context, uh, this is the apostle pre uh, Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. And uh, at, towards the end of his sermon, he says to the people gathered there at Jerusalem on, this, on a special day, Acts 2.38, Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And in that same context, in verse 41, it says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now, if you look at these verses, you know, being saved, salvation, those words aren't mentioned specifically. But notice in verse 38, it speaks about the remission of sins, or some translations say the forgiveness of sins. And then also in verse 41, it speaks about them being added. They were added to them. Well, they weren't added to lost sinners, right? They didn't go from a state of being lost to, to being added to those who were lost. They're now added to God's people. They're now added to the church, the body of Christ. And so they're now added to those who are saved. And so this is salvation language, you know, speaking about having your sins forgiven or remitted, being added to God's people. This is a description of someone who's now saved, someone who's now faithful to God. And again, notice Peter's words here, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Again, why? What's the purpose here? He doesn't say this is it's an empty ceremony to show that you've already been saved. That kind of definition of, of baptism is nowhere found in the scriptures. He says, for the remission of sins. That is to obtain the remission uh, of sins. And notice once again, repentance and baptism go together. Just like faith and baptism go together uh, that we saw earlier from Mark 16. So again, these things do not contradict one another. Uh, repentance and baptism, all these things are acts of faith, an acknowledging of God's will and wanting to follow his will and submit to his will. And uh, it really is, is sad. It's, it's just uh, lamentable how many people in the world are just completely ignorant of baptism or trying to give some unscriptural definition to it and make this way more complicated than what the Bible presents. And Peter told them, repent and be baptized. We see the people's response in verse 41. Those who gladly received his word, that is the word that Peter preached. Again, they didn't sit there and say, well, what do you mean? I don't understand. What's the purpose of baptism? What is all this? You don't make any sense to us. No, they, it says they were baptized, right? He's very clear. Repent and be baptized. Those who received his word were baptized. It really is that simple. And you notice when they were baptized, that's when they're added. They're added to them and added to the believers, the body of Christ, those, those who are saved, etc. Um, one more passage for you, Colossians 2, verses uh, 11 and following. 
um, here it says, And whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now, there's a, there's a lot in this verse, or in these verses, worth considering, and a lot of things here could uh, merit further explanation, but if I went into all that, we'd be here for another, you know, half hour or more. You know, I just want to focus on what's highlighted on the screen. Again, at what point in time is someone able to put off the body of the sins of the flesh? At what point in time is a person forgiven of all trespasses? What an amazing blessing that is. The, the New Testament teaches all your mistakes, all your wrongs can be forgiven. And so we should know when that takes place. Well, we're told here, when you're buried with him in baptism. And I want you to notice once again, there's a, there seems to be a repetition of thought as you trace this idea throughout Scripture. Baptism and faith coincide. Uh, they're not separate events. You don't say, I believe in Jesus. I believe in the gospel. I want to respond to the gospel. And weeks later, months later, when it's convenient, then I'll be baptized. No, notice faith is actually connected to the very act of baptism itself. Right? Buried with him in baptism and then risen with him through what? Through the faith of the operation of God. So again, if a person has genuine faith in the gospel message... They're going to submit to this important teaching that Christ himself commanded and that the apostles uh, commanded. So again, just as we read in Acts twenty two sixteen, 16, when Paul was uh, told by Ananias, why are you waiting? Get up, get baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. We see that same concept here. And it's when a person is buried with Christ, that's when the body of the sins of the flesh is removed from that person. And it's a highly symbolic way of just saying all their sins are removed. They're forgiven of all trespasses. Now, with all that in mind, uh, the, uh, the, the New Testament does not teach baptism only. There are several important things that lead up to the act of baptism. And first and foremost is, is faith. You know, faith has always been essential to salvation, even when we look at the Old Testament. And uh, we need to know that you know, faith in Scripture is something specific. Um, when we look at the Old Testament for those ancient Jews, those ancient Israelites to be saved, to have faith, it meant that their faith in the Lord God excluded belief in all other gods, in all other belief systems. Um, consider this statement made here in Exodus 23, verse 13. And here in the Old Testament, these are the words of Moses. Or we should say the Lord God speaking through Moses. And all things that I've said unto you, uh, and in all things I've said unto you, be circumspect. And make no mention of the name of other gods. Neither let it be heard out of thy mouth. So Moses taught the ancient people of Israel not even to speak the name of other gods. And so they were to have no association, no participation in the pagan faiths or religions of those nations that were uh, around, around Israel. Right now, they, a lot of them didn't always follow that, but that's what God wanted from them. Right? Don't even say these things. And uh, the New Testament is just as crystal clear. Uh, regarding our faith, the, the Christian faith is not a faith which should be mingled with other belief systems, mingled with philosophy, worldly philosophies, and so on. According to the New Testament, the only faith that is going to save someone today is faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, the Apostle Peter said the following uh, about Jesus. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. 
Acts 4, verse 12. And so faith in Jesus Christ is crucial for anyone who wants to be saved by his atoning sacrifice. Um, repentance is also necessary. And again, those, those few passages we looked at regarding baptism, even within the context of baptism, sometimes faith is mentioned, sometimes repentance is mentioned. You have to look at the whole context, the whole sum uh, of Scripture. The, the Bible does not teach we're saved by one thing and one thing only. And the Bible doesn't say we're saved by faith only or repentance only or baptism only or God's grace only. Right? All these things are part of God's plan uh, that we ought to, to consider and, and follow. So why repent? Why should we repent? Can the scriptures say, and this, is against, this is, would be applicable for someone who's not a Christian... Someone who's not yet believed and responded to the gospel the way the New Testament teaches. The Bible says, repent ye therefore and be converted. Why? Again, what's the purpose? To what ends? He says that your sins may be blotted out. Uh, a newer version I read says that your sins may be wiped away like a clean slate. Right? When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Acts 3.19. And so if a person wants that blessing... Person wants their sins wiped away, that debt cleared, uh, they must be willing to repent. Uh, confession is necessary. And the kind of confession that I'm uh, describing this morning is, is confessing one's faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, the New Testament teaches a person ought to speak out loud that they have faith in Jesus. Um, again, I think a very uh, kind of iconic and, and familiar verse regarding this, Romans 10, verse 9. That if I confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead. Again, notice what it says here. I'm trying to share with you in passages which specifically mention salvation. Why? Why should we confess our faith in Christ? Why should we believe that God raised him from the dead? To be saved, right? He says, thou shalt be saved. And so again, this does not contradict passages we've read about faith. These do not contradict passages we've read about repentance or baptism. All these things complement one another. Uh, they are in harmony with one another. Uh, so again, we ought to be willing to confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is, is Lord. He is the Lord Jesus. Uh, and then lastly, abiding in Christ is necessary to be saved. Once someone is a Christian, uh, the New Testament teach, teaches that man, that woman, uh, is to abide in the teachings of Christ. You know, if a person's attitude is, I will never give up, I will always be loyal to Jesus Christ, then there is nothing in this world that can separate that person from the love of God. Uh, once again, consider Paul's words. Uh, he wrote these to uh, Timothy, but certainly we can make an um, application for ourselves. Uh, this is found in 2 Timothy 3, verses 14 and 15. And the Bible says here, continue. Uh, continue thou the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation uh, through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Again, notice at the end of this passage, you can see the word salvation. So continue here is an important word. Why should we continue in the things we have learned from the Bible? Again, we're told here why. It's because the Holy Scriptures are able to give you wisdom. They're able to give you the knowledge you need for salvation. Again, this wisdom is obtained by those who continue. And not just continue, but continue the things they've learned and been assured of from God's Word. Um, it really you know, it's astound, it astounds me sometimes. People will be Christians for, for years... They'll come to church sometimes, but they're not continuing in this. We have to continue in this. If we want to have confidence that we are fulfilling God's word and that we truly are saved. One of the unique features of the book of Acts is that it contains many accounts about people who are lost and then what they did to become saved. Again, that's unique regarding the book of Acts. Lots of other parts of the Bible have important you know, information about salvation. But when you read, for example, Romans all the way through Revelation, those books are written to churches and individuals who are already Christians. 
And Acts is unique because we read about people who are not Christians, people who are lost, and then how they became Christians, how they had their sins washed away, had their sins forgiven by the blood of Christ. And that information is so important today and relevant today because a person, this is not an exaggeration, but exaggeration, a person could literally visit 10 different so-called churches and learn about 10 different ways to be saved. And we should know that this lack of unity, this doesn't come from following the New Testament. It comes from believing in teachings and traditions, which either just pick out one little bit of what the New Testament says, or following traditions which, uh, again, were made up by men who do not have the Holy Spirit. Faith is action. You know, faith, of course, it starts in our minds. It might start as a feeling, as an emotion. But ultimately, if we truly have faith, if we truly have trust or confidence in Jesus Christ, that's going to lead to action. We're going to act on that, uh, that belief. And let me just quickly you know, run through this again in, in the proper order. I kind of went out of order this morning. But uh, just uh, again, here in order, if a person genuinely believes in Jesus Christ, genuinely believes in what the Bible itself says, then he or she is going to respond by, again, mention belief here. We're going to believe in Christ, believe in the gospel message, uh, believe that he went to the cross and so that only you as an individual can have forgiveness. But all those who will also put their faith in him can have forgiveness as well. And again, the Bible doesn't teach, well, that's it. It's just faith alone. You'll never find the words faith alone in scripture, except for in James 2, where it says a man is justified by works and not by faith only. That's the only place you'll find faith alone, right? Real faith is connected to several other important acts of obedience or submission and following what the, the New Testament says. Again, one of them is repenting. Uh, if we have faith, we are to repent from dead works. We are to confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we're to believe in him, believe everything the gospel says about him, that God raised him from the dead. Uh, we are to be baptized. This is something Jesus himself not only submitted to, but again, after his death, burial, and resurrection, when the New Testament has fully come into force, he commanded it. The apostles commanded it. And they tell us now that the New Testament has fully flourished, the purpose of baptism, right? Mark 16, to, to believe and be baptized, why? To be saved. Acts 2, 38, why? To have your sins remitted. Acts 22, 16, why? To have your sins washed away. These are the biblical reasons for baptism. None of this foolishness about an outward sign of an inward faith, outward sign of an inward grace. The Bible does not use that language anywhere in Scripture. And then once a person is buried with Christ, raised by their faith in the operation of the power of God, that is when all their trespasses are, are forgiven, and then the New Testament says, keep on keeping on, right? Continue in the faith, continue to learn and grow, continue in that walk with Christ. And so if there's anyone here this morning who has not yet done these things, if you're subject to the invitation, uh, the invitation to become a Christian is always extended uh, and we can aid you in putting Christ on a baptism if you're ready for that. If you'd ever like Bible study, a personal Bible study, I'm always available for that. Just let me know. Um, but if there's anyone who is subject to the invitation, please let us know by coming forward as we stand and as we sing.